Hey, you know what? Each and every single one of us has a story to tell. And uh, I know each and every week that, you know, we can come and we can gather in church and you can hear from, you know, pastors kind of all over the city. And, you know, and, and that's great. You know, I, I mean, myself, I do have a story to tell. And, you know, and I hope and pray that every single week that for those of you that come to this church and those of you that don't, you're welcome to every single week. We'd love that. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's kind of neat when you can hear stories of other people. You know, because again, like I could go and share, you know, on different things. And, you know, some of you might be like, well, of course you act like that. Of course you have to think like that. You're a pastor. You're not allowed to struggle with, you know, like temptation and anger and, you know, and unforgiveness. Of course, like, of course you can't. You're a pastor. You're perfect. <laughs> and for most cases, you're right. No, I'm just joking. No, we put a sign on our, on our front, like on our building, it says, no perfect people including the pastor. And so I think it's an awesome opportunity for us to be able to gather and, uh, and, and, and hear stories from other people. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to stall any longer. It's, it's my great pleasure um, to invite up to this stage. And would you go ahead and give them a huge round of applause from the Edmonton Eskimos, Mr. Nate Kuhorn. And because it's Mother's Day, his mom, Liz. <laughs> Keep clapping, they're still walking. Have a seat, guys. You can move this pillow. The pillow is just there purely for decorative purposes. Yeah, I'm starting so. to see that now that I'm, you know, well, it's just married and the wife's every uh, You know, that's a, that's a great point. A uh, Soon, man, you've like been married for a year, right? A year, year and, and a, a bit, a year and a half. Soon, you'll have, like, more pillows than, like, underwear on your bed. Yes, I'm starting to see that. Oh, yeah, yeah, throw pillow. And those, they're just purely decorative. You're not allowed to, like, use them or anything like that, you know. But, uh, no, no, you can't. Actually, it's just, don't even, no, I'm just bugging. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, hey, it is such a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Nate and, uh, and his mom here this morning. I actually, I met um, Nate, uh, you know what, I was, we were talking on the phone the other day trying to figure out, but it was years ago, I worked at a kid's camp called Eagle's Nest Ranch, and, uh, and, and Liz and her husband Tim, who's here, Tim, let's give a big round of applause to Tim. <clears throat> Uh, they were on the board out at Eagle's Nest, so I got to know them kind of just through the happenings of that. And they also, you know, kind of, well, they sent their son, Adam. You'll hear the story. They've got, they've got four amazing kids. They sent their son to Eagle's Nest, and they basically, because he was a board member, he says, yeah, my son's working here this summer. And I was like, okay, so no hiring process like normal? <laughs> like, you know, and so Adam, I don't even know, is Adam here this morning? Adam is here. There he is, Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty much just as big as Nate. I remember when Adam first came out, he was this kind of like little scrawny skater. And uh, it was so much fun beating him up. <laughs> or at least razzing him. In my head I was thinking, but like I wouldn't want to mess with him right now. So you'll, you'll see him. He's basically the same size as Nate here. But, uh, so I, I met you guys kind of through Eagle's Nest uh, years ago. And um, I just think it's uh, awesome to have, you know, this amazing... Uh, football player here, and the, the mom who essentially made him that amazing football player. It's true, though, right? It's true. Like, dad was always the one that was practicing in the backyard, you know, like practicing hitting and catching and throwing and, you know, and, and just like game in and game out, practice in, practice out. But then sure enough, I'm guessing, you know, when you won the Grey Cup, you just were like, hey, mom, you know, it's like, what about the dad? The dad kind of put in all the effort. But anyhow... So, you know what, just to kind of give people an opportunity to kind of get to know you guys a little bit, I've just got a series of questions, and these questions are very unrelated to what we had pre-discussed earlier this week. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So I think it'll give, give you guys a little bit of inside scoop as to kind of who, who they are. So, you know what, I, did, I haven't even said it yet, but happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Where's my mama? There's mama, happy Mother's Day. I love you. <clears throat> and, the, and the mother of my kids, I love her too. I don't know where she is. <laughs> happy Mother's Day, I babe. I a quick story. You, I would love to hear a quick story. I just uh, had my first experience being left alone with the baby for about three or four hours while my wife got her hair done. It's a, wait, wait, wait. Three hours to get your hair done? I, uh, don't even get me going on the price. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, 
I uh, have a lot, lot, I already had a lot of respect, but I have a lot more respect because I could not uh, handle that, even in like three hours, so hats off to all the moms out there. You guys That's are right. warriors. And you know, real quick, uh, Nate got married, well, like we said, a year and a half ago, and this is Tegan, that's his wife sitting in front row, go ahead and give a wave. Ooh. This is her very first Mother's Day, isn't it? I hope it's way better than my wife's, let me put it that way. <clears throat> You, if you've been here, you've heard my story of First Mother's Day for Shyla. So, okay, um, you guys ready for this? It's going to be just a real quick little, uh, it's kind of like a would you rather or, you know, what would you choose, okay? So you guys can just kind of take turns. Some of these might not necessarily relate to Liz, but some of them might not relate to you. So uh, bacon or sausage? Bacon. 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 Uh, would you rather run or lift weights? Run. Run. It, it shows, it shows, not, not Nate. <clears throat> uh, beach or mountains? <laughs> mountains. I'll go beach. You know, I'm surprised nobody said a beach with mountains behind it. Ooh. Hey, that's good. Just saying, just saying. Yeah. Uh, are you guys early bird or night owls? I'm an early bird for sure. Probably early. But what, I don't... What's early, Liz? Is that like six or eight or nine? What are we, what are we talking? Six or seven. Six or... Oh, that's early bird for sure. <laughs> the early bird gets the worm, right? <laughs> Paperback or ebook? Paperback. Ebook. Yeah? Is that just because they're cheaper? Yeah, probably. I'm Dutch, so... <laughs> are you Dutch? I'm Dutch, bro. Yes. Are you? You ain't Dutch. You ain't... Uh, you're still a lot. <clears throat> All right. Uh, sweet or sour? Sweet. Sweet. Dark meat or white meat? White. Dark. Really? Shopping or spa date? This one's really tough, I know. Spa. 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 I'm not judging. Um, this one, this one, just because it relates to me so well, would you rather have like an immaculate dessert, like at a nice restaurant, or just a second entree? Immaculate dessert. Second entree. Hey, me too, bro. <laughs> I'm all about the entrees. <clears throat> um, ready, Liz? This one's for you. Rap music or rock music? Neither. <laughs> rap? What, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what do you listen to when you work out? Other, I mean, other than Katy Perry, I, I heard that. <laughs> Well, pretty much just the radio, because we're all like, working out as a team, so we don't really, can't really put the headphones on. But in but, my locker room, um, there's a lot of rap that gets played. Not saying I like it, but we do have a thing called White Boy Wednesdays, and I crank my country on then, so. You're a country boy? Oh, yeah. Really? <clears throat> okay, would you, would you rather call or text? Text. Text? Text. Action movie or chick flick? Chick flick. Action. Called that one in my head. Uh, if, if you could have a superpower, would you rather be able to fly or would you rather be invisible? Invisible. Yeah, I would take invisible too. I like to Sneak. pester people and stuff, so I feel like if I was invisible, it would just like... What would your, would your superhero name be like? Creeper Kuhorn or something like that? Or? <laughs> I like that. That's good, CC. yeah. CC, yep. Yeah. I like it. Okay, and this one might be specifically a little bit more for Nate, but would you rather lose to me in an arm wrestle or lose your big toes? Um, lose to you in an arm wrestle. We can make that happen. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, um, before we get serious, um, Nate, what, what's one thing, okay, because... I'm guessing that majority of people have never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, Nate Kuhorn before, um, other than maybe the first two rows, three rows here. But that's all his family, okay? Um, what is one thing that would surprise us about you that people don't get to see on the, on the public kind of thing? Uh, like, obviously, we just learned country music, so that's, that <laughs> can't um, use that one. One thing that would surprise you, uh, ooh, I'm pretty... I'm a very organized person, almost to the point of OCD, and same thing for being punctual, so that might surprise somebody. But it's like, it's like borderline like crazy. Really? Yeah. Oh, come on. 
<laughs> yeah? <laughs> Tegan's like, actually, he's, he usually says it's CDO with letters in the right order, so. <clears throat> All right. OCD, CDO, yeah, yeah. right alphabetical? Oh, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Not many days am I quicker than Nate Kuhorn. <laughs> um, Liz. Say it again. Liz, that's. Oh. <laughs> Are you it's giving just... me the same question? No, no, I got a whole new question for you. <laughs> okay. Whole new. Okay. So just... Okay, obviously, obviously, your son plays professional football, won a great cup. You know, very proud, you know, kind of moment for you. But, you know, can you maybe just kind of share a little bit transparent, and this might be a serious question, but can you share a time when you maybe were embarrassed um, as for Nate or maybe just even, like, not so proud of him? That's yeah. deep, eh? Um, well, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be transparent here. <laughs> so. Uh-oh. If you can't be transparent serious. in church, you can't be transparent oh, anywhere. Oh. So. Um, just when they, uh, well, it was Nathan and Adam, they got into a really bad fight at the, I forget what place that was, doesn't matter. Garage. But the garage. They got into a really bad fight and they ended in up. In town here? Yes. Oh, man. After, uh, yeah, and then um, they ended up. serious. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> they ended up getting a criminal record about, over it. Really? Yeah. So that was hard. We didn't need to go that deep, but... <laughs> no, I think that's great. That's transparent. Adam's like, yes. Sorry, Adam. Got thrown under the bus in the first four and a half minutes. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Twice, yeah. Once by me, right, right. I'm going to be honest here. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, just kind of switching gears here. Nate, um, you, you played at, at Medicine Hat High School here. You were a Mohawk for three years, grade 10, 11, 12. Um, and uh, um, your coach, Quinn Skelton, right? Quinn Skelton, was it? I think he's still, is he still the coach there? Yep. Phenomenal coach, phenomenal football coach. But this is what he said about you in, in a previous interview that he did. Uh, this, he's speaking of, of Nate. He said, he was a one-man machine in a lot of our games, and he literally won a couple games for us just on his own ath- athletic ability. So my question is, is, when did you know that you were awesome? <laughs> like, when did it dawn on you that you were like, I'm pretty amazing at this? <laughs> well, uh, growing up when I got to high school, I thought I was a little more than amazing. I was a pretty um, cocky young fellow back mm-hmm. then, but uh, I, I didn't realize that I was going to have a professional chance until like uh, third year university. So, yeah, I, was a little, I thought I was a little too amazing back in the day, so... You'll hear so it that. gradually actually decreases what you're saying. You're like own amazingness. Yes, I got a little more humble, mm. a little more wise. And was that a result of the coach that you had? Was that Coach uh, Neil? Yeah, coach, coach. Yeah, yeah. We had a couple run-ins, and yeah, uh, yeah he uh, helped me with my character, and you know, helped me be humble. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of stories, but I'll kind of leave the stories out. But yeah, we had uh, we had some run-ins. Cool. <clears throat> um. Now, uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but I mean, like, like high school football or even like junior kids football, like a lot of people play football, um, you know, a, a lot, right? And, and I think a lot will play high school and then like, you know, some will get the opportunity to play college and kind of like a smaller amount will get the opportunity to play pro, but then even like a smaller amount, right? And you guys would, would know this is like, get to hoist that great cup. So what was, what was going on in your mind that moment? I, I think, do we, do we have a picture? Yeah, there, there's, there's Nate with his mom. <clears throat> and this is, I think this is right after the Grey Cup, is it not? That's, yeah, like five minutes after. Five minutes one, after. Yeah. So yeah. What's, what's going on inside your head at, at like this moment? Oh, man, it was just so surreal, just the way the game had been going and stuff like that, getting down early and, uh, you know, just playing in a great cup is pretty crazy, but then, you know, all of a sudden you see the clock hit zero and boom, green and gold confetti everywhere, yeah, you know, yeah. my parents are coming on the field, they're setting up the stage for the award, it's just so surreal and uh, it was, I wish I could have shared it with my wife, but she was eight and three months, three Eight months and three weeks pregnant. So she was already en route to the hospital. It was awesome to share with my parents, though, because uh, they deserve it. They've been by my side through the whole, yeah. my whole sports career. So yeah. yeah. 
Well, and I mean, you play for the Eskimos, you're going to get another chance, right? Yep. You know what? No perfect people. Yeah, we, we, we play that card, but I mean, if you're going to stoop that low. <clears throat> what, what about you, Liz? I mean, and I kind of already alluded to this, but like, like, it, like say even in this moment here, you know, you look at that picture, you know, what, what's going on inside your head at that moment? It was really amazing because it looked like at that game we were going to lose. Yeah. And then I got a text from a friend, and she, 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 like she was watching it too, and she said she prayed that God would work something miraculous through him and with him. So at that moment, Tim and I, we, we prayed too, and it was just shortly after that too that, boom. There, and, and that was an amazing catch. That catch. That was, Thanks, Bob. Yeah, you're welcome. Hug it out. We, it was awesome. That's great. <laughs> No, it really was. I don't know if you guys seen the, it was if miraculous. you watched it was the Great awesome. Cup, but you know, Nate, you did. You made that catch. And I think yeah. I even texted you shortly thereafter. I was like, by the way, that catch was a TD catch. And I mean, yeah. you watch replay. It was, he was in, right? But that was like a game saving yeah. catch. Exactly. You know, like, Thanks. how do you process that? How do you, like, does that fall into like the, yeah, I am amazing kind of <laughs> thing again? Like, how do you, how do you, you know, this is totally off script, but how do you deal with kind of like the praise that you get, you know, as, I mean, not only as a professional football player, but as a great cup champion, you know, like. Yeah, that was pretty intense and that was an intense game, but you get like, you get caught up in the game. You don't realize like, oh, we're down. We got to, you know, we got to have a big play to get us in, you know, range to score a touchdown. But uh, I just felt, I was just happy to contribute because I had zero catches up to that. So I had one catch for nine yards in the great cup. So it's not as good as it sounds. It was, a, it was an all right game, but... Uh, There's that humility coming into play. <laughs> um, I, I forgot the rest of the question. Uh, just, you know, how do you, how do you oh, continually yeah, yeah. stay humble? Like, I, I've, I guess I, I've heard it said that, you know, in, in kind of like the, the, uh, the spotlight that, that professional athletes are in, you know, is, is you, you, you forget the best and you forget the worst. You know, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. I mean, everybody has critics, right? Like, oh, yeah. you could find hate on you on the internet like that if you wanted to, right? Yes. I mean, we can find it about our church. It's, you check our Facebook page, you'll see it there, right? But um, you, you kind of have to ignore, right? Don't you kind of have to ignore kind of like the worst and, sure. and the best? And... Yeah, for sure. And I, especially it's something I struggled with a lot in my past. And, you know, it doesn't get any easier uh, being a professional athlete where, you know, yeah. everything is kind of catered to you, you know what I mean? Like doctors and, just, like, everything is just like, yeah. you know, you want an MRI, you get your MRI tomorrow. Like, your surgery is, like, the next day. You, like, just, like, yeah. all that stuff and just fan, like, it gets crazy, but, you know, you just got to remind those people. I, like, personally have to remind those people, like, like I'm just God's tool, you know what I mean? God's just yeah, yeah. using me how he wants to right. use me. It's not like... Uh, when the doctor does a the surgery, they don't go up to the scalpel and say, good work, scalpel, you know, you, you know, that was a great, great job there. You know, it's the person behind the tool. So, you know, that's what I've, you know, 29, right. I'm getting a little bit wiser, a little bit. You're so 29? I, yeah, okay, yeah. A little bit wiser. So I've, yeah. I found that out, that God's just using me with my platform. Right. It's one thing I've learned. Do you, do you think that marriage kind of like shifted that in you at all? Like over the past year and a half? I just know like, I mean... In my own life, you know, the number one person that keeps me humble is my wife. And that's no disrespect to my wife. I'm just saying, like, I think it's, a, I think it's great that our spouse is kind of, like, they help us stay grounded. You know what I mean? Like, would any other, you know, man in here say, yeah, that's, that's my wife. She kind of keeps me grounded. No, I'm alone in that. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I got your back. You, me and him. Yeah. You guys are on the outside of me and Nate's inner circle. <clears throat> yeah, no, Tegan's got, Tegan's got a little bit of fire in her, and uh, it helps to Amen. get control because I, I can be stubborn, and she's, she looks like she's a nice little pretty girl, but, you know, uh, she, can, she can put me in line quick. Yeah, it's the look, really, is all it takes, the you look. know. That's true. It's true. It's the look. You just, like, look away. You turn your stone, right? <clears throat> Don't be offended. Oh, man. <laughs> Some of you are judging me right now. <laughs> you can polish your halos later. Um, Liz, you know, I, kind of in preparation for, you know, this today, I, I, I Googled the heck out of you guys, you know, and you have a 
amazing past. No, I'm just fucking. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I was able to watch some interviews, you know, where you guys did with like, I don't know if it was a chat TV or oh. global or, you know, but uh, yeah, you and Tim were wearing your like, you know, Kuhorn jerseys, you know, repping the 85. And I was, I was thinking I was going to buy one this morning, but then I thought that'd be weird if I was like Kuhorn up here and you were the real Nate Kuhorn. That'd be awesome. Would it? Yeah. Are you saying that because you get like a kickback on every jersey? So <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Um, My jersey. I'm not Mike Riley, so. <clears throat> yeah. Um, no, but I watched these interviews, and, and it was you know neat because y- you don't just have Nate. You have you have three other boys, and I think I think two of them are here, right? Corey's here, right? And and Adam's here. But uh, you know, um, what what parenting tips? Because in this interview, you guys had talked about you know like the the hospital visits you know, that you guys had to make with boys being boys and kind of fighting and playing football. Mm. I think at one point, like, didn't Nate, didn't you break Adam's collarbone or something like that? Yeah. Uh, well, it was just a, a, it was a legal, legal hit. It was a legal and hit. the result was a broken collarbone. So, and this legal hit was determined as the, like, like Jimmy, the neighbor referee or? <laughs> no, I was the referee. Oh, like, you. We did, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Totally, totally good. Right? But, I mean, obviously, and, and I just know, like, because I'm, I'm, I come from a family where, like, my parents, they had five boys, right? Really? And so, I mean, oh, yeah, we, we, we fought a no lot. No girls? No girls, no. We had to marry them in. Yeah. 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 I was, I was looking for a hot wife, and I was just, like, always thinking, like, who, who would bring my mom the most pleasure in a beautiful daughter-in-law? That's... <laughs> Landed both. But anyhow, so I, I know in my family, I mean, you know, four boys or four, you know, I had four brothers, you know, and, and obviously you guys have, you know, uh, you have three brothers, but how did, like, what parenting advice would you give, you know, to the, to the moms in here that, you know, have like four, like, rambunctious boys or three or even one, you know, like, how do you raise not just one boy, but, but four? Eesh, it's a good question. <laughs> you just do what you got to do. I don't know. But they, um, hmm, I'm just, uh, so what's... Like when, when you, let me put it this way, when, when you kind of seen them, you know, because you know the term like boys will be boys, you know, and I mean, my, my son, I've got, you know, a, a seven-year-old and uh, I had to think about that. Um, but like anything he finds can be a gun, you know, like he could yeah, pick up oh, like a, a ball. Yeah. And be like, psh, 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 you know, like, yeah. like boys would be boys. Like, do Guns. you, do you, like, did you kind of like really encourage that, you know, or do you well, try I to try, curb that or? I try, like, I, I, I tried to discourage guns, but you can't really do it because. We Tim, to, Tim undid everything you did anyway. Well, they would, we had a cucumber business, right? That's right. So yeah. then they'd go in the greenhouse and pretend a cucumber was a gun. Well, naturally, so. naturally. <laughs> you couldn't sell those ones anyway. They're <laughs> odd shape, right? So you can't really do that and you just gotta um i don't know you just she, she you know just what? joined in she was a good target for our cork guns and stuff with the yeah guns. that too and you got to keep them busy yeah like boys are got lots of energy you got to keep them involved in things that's what i found is um like sports they were in soccer they you know i would like them to be outside i didn't really I mean, they had a limit on amount of TV, you know, kind of, yeah. that they could watch. I didn't really want that, which I want them to be more outside and get into sports and stuff like that. And they, yeah. like, we had a basketball hoop in the backyard. They played basketball. It was Trevor and, because Trevor was the oldest, and then it would be Trevor and Adam against Corey and Nathan. And that would be the football, too, because... <coughs> Naturally, yep. Trevor would try to protect Adam because he was a smaller one, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. You know, and... See, I told, I told you guys he was small back then. <laughs> well, the young, yeah. So, you know, keep him busy and take him to church. Teach him the Woo! things. I would. Teach take him, him the church. things. That's important. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> kind of be careful. Try to, well, which I should have been more careful of who they kind of hang out with. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, like look into, I mean, I should have looked into more who they were hanging out with, which I, that's one of the things I could have looked, you know, like now, I guess, if I was doing it again, I'd probably look into what's the fam, what's the home life like of the other um, people they're involved with, you know, right. like, yeah, yeah. And because they get influenced, right? Absolutely. 
by that kind of yep. stuff. So I messed up that and right, right. a little bit in some ways. Yeah. Because I knew, yeah. One hmm. of the kids, his dad was probably doing drugs and stuff, whatever. And right. But sometimes it's sometimes you're it's con it's a constant thing too with kids, and sometimes you get weary. Mm. And you gotta push through. How many moms would relate to that? Sometimes you get weary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's. <laughs> She's... And then you kind of. Yeah. Like I should have had the computer. Like I had the computer downstairs for one thing. Right. And you know because it, it, but I should have had it right upstairs, right? Yeah. Because then whatever you know, there's. Yeah. Crap things, that comes on absolutely. there and. Yeah. So. So essentially, like just being a parent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, you know, kind of on the note of, you know, um, like four boys, I remember I, I went to uh, like a, just a, a kids, you know how you can go up to like the leisure center and watch like these little kids like this tall play football. Have you guys ever done that? I got invited by a friend and I remember watching this game and there was this kid, you guys are thinking like, is this us? No, this was not you guys. Um, but there was this kid literally and he was just average size and, and every time he got the ball, he would like mow people over. You know, and just go. And he was actually, he was smaller than a lot of these people. And I leaned over to my buddy and I was like, man, alive, that kid has got it. Like, what's his story? You know, and he says, well, he's the youngest of four boys. So naturally, right? But like, you're the, the, the third, right? Do you, do you think that played into kind of your, your football career? Like, you know, having two older brothers that, you know, kind of beat up on you every now and then? And <laughs> Yeah, I think for sure. Um, that definitely made me tough. But, it, you know, it was always good to have one little brother to tackle and stuff. But, no, with, with <laughs> I was my, like, uh, I'll take that. With my two older brothers, they were, like, super dedicated people. And, like, yeah. they were the type of, like, types of guys that, like, would just try to perfect something. Like, Corey was a goalie uh, back in the day, and he would just, like, every night be, like, doing some type of drill or you know, some mm -hmm. type of exercise. Same with Trevor, like we had weights in our basement and he would just like, at like 14, 15 years old, he was just like on a weight program, like religiously. Mm -hmm. So for me, and then obviously they went on to play football and yep. have a lot of success. So for me to watch that, that definitely helped me become the, you know, dedicated, right. hardworking type athlete yeah. that I am now. So not, not even just physically, but even like kind of mentally, it, it helped you oh, for kind sure. of prepare. That's cool. Um, when, when, when you played, uh, like, like I had mentioned, you played grade 10, 11, 12 here, and then I think a couple years of junior football, is that what it's called, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then obviously UFC and, you know, but again, like, you know, in these other interviews that he's done, you know, you, you've been quoted as saying, like, you, you kind of made some bad decisions or you, you know, and you kind of alluded to it, like, just kind of like that kind of like I'm amazing, kind of cocky, you know, attitude or whatever. But, uh, like, can you expand maybe on, like, some of these bad decisions that you were making in those kind of earlier years of football and life? Yeah, for sure. Um, I grew up going to the Christian school until grade 9. So I'm going to try to make this quick version. So from grade 9 to grade 10, I went to Hat High. So, you know, big, I guess uh, I went from a school of about 180 students in 10 grades to a student or a school that had about 2,000 students in like three or four grades. So, um, you know, I was the new kid. I was the typical new kid. Uh, wasn't sure what my, you know, foundation was and stuff like that. So I ended up getting involved with a lot of the wrong people mm -hmm. in high school and lots of people, you know, that would just, you know, tell me I was a good athlete or tell me I was this tough guy. Um, so that kind of, I let people back then kind of tell me what my identity was and I should have, you know, I didn't have a foundation back then. I kind of just was a Christian because my parents told me to be a Christian and because, you know, came to church. Pastors told me to become a Christian at school, Christian school. Everybody was Christian. So I was like, yeah, I'm a Christian. But all of a sudden you get to high school and you get tested. Like you're like thrown into, you know, pretty much <laughs> the gates of hell pretty much. It's crazy. Like <laughs> the world, right? The world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely wore me down. I can, you know, I can definitely say that. And I joined the wrong crowd and you know, like I said, my identity got really messed up, and uh, it led to me making a lot of mistakes. Um, just the kind of person I am, my personality is like 110% or nothing. So, um, you know, once I got into something, I would, like, want to pursue that 110% or, you know, I wasn't into it. And, you know, all of a sudden, I'd show up to a party, and I'd be like, hey, 
you know, I'm the new kid. How are people going to accept me? Oh, I'm going to go do something, the dumbest thing or the craziest thing at this party, 110% or nothing, and then people are going to accept me. So that's kind of how I, so that got me into, like, legal trouble and, uh, you know, yeah. trouble along the road. And, you know, it started to get worse and worse. And, yeah, I got into a couple of legal things. And, yeah, without going into a bunch of, I could be here talking for half an hour. But, yeah, so probably uh, putting myself with the wrong types of friends and letting them tell me who I was. Right, right, right. And, you know, looking back now, like, can you, can you identify kind of like maybe what you were feeling in those moments of, you know, maybe even like kind of after you had like these, these, these charges laid against you and you kind of expanded on the phone earlier this week about, you know, some other kind of just dumb decisions legally, you know, can you look back and kind of like maybe think of like, you know, what were you, what were you feeling after that? You know, like, just, was it humiliation? Was it like, man, I am B.A., like, to the core, yo, you know? like. <laughs> well, before I got into trouble, I thought I was B.A. to the core. Right. You know I mean, I was walking around with the Chuck Liddell mohawk. Uh, you know, I thought I was the toughest, coolest person around, but, um, like, Co like, when I made, met Coach Blake Nill, he had a huge impact on my life, too. Um, this the, is your coach at uh, UFC. University of Calgary, right. yeah. yeah. So, Went through training camp there. I was named a starter, coming in as a starting receiver for the first game. First game was in uh, at Simon Fraser, and so we flew out to, I think we stayed in Abbotsford. And, uh, you know, a couple hours, my parents had come out, and brother, a couple hours before the game, we go to Safeway and, uh, you know, get some energy drinks for the game or whatever, and Sports Illustrated, and I just decided to, you know, throw a couple power bars in my pocket. Like, this wasn't something I... Um, was new to doing. I, you know, I did all this. I thought I could get away with whatever I wanted. Right. I wanted to have the best things. I yep. wanted to look the best. I wanted, like, you know, be the most risky so I would get attention, right? Right. So did that, and all of a sudden, someone grabs me on the wrist as I'm walking out the store, and some secret shoppers will get you. No. <laughs> but, yeah, I got, I got, that's probably one of the best things that happened to me. I got, I got caught, and uh, what was supposed to be my first CIS football start, I ended up, uh, after a big, long thrashing by Coach Nil, I ended up uh, getting suspended for two games. So I watched, the, I watched the game from the stands with my parents, and I watched somebody else play my position, and it wasn't, I, uh, I definitely felt humiliated and a lot, right. of, a lot of shame. Yeah. Just a, just a quick inside look. What, when, when those, because we see that in professional sports, you know, players making dumb decisions and getting benched. What's the, what's the kind of the feel in the locker room? during those moments? Like, I mean, obviously you say, like, just humiliated and shame, but, you know, just like, like the camaraderie of the team, like, how, how do those decisions affect kind of the people around you that you're, I mean, you're supposed to be super tight with, right? Yeah, I wish, uh, I wish I would have been that kind of leadership type guy that made everything tight, you know, one, as, as being one of the better players on the team, you're kind of looked at as a leader on the team, and you're, mm -hmm. you're supposed to lead by example, but, you know, we had a good team, but we had a lot of individuals on that team, and I was one of them, and, you know, we, we tore the team apart. So when that happened, I don't think anybody was really surprised because they kind of, they knew my character, and they knew I would do something dumb like that. So right. I don't think it surprised anyone, but, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, like I said, I wish I could have I I went back and been more of a leader and uh, right. more of that humble guy with good character. Right. Go ahead. I think that that was an answer to prayer for me, that he got caught. Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. And I think that Blake Nill was an answer to prayer. Yeah. I remember one comment he said was, um, you can't let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> and that was so good. <laughs> he was good. Anyways, I won. He probably didn't use that in, in the locker room, hell, hey? No, <laughs> but uh, he definitely, he knew what it took to win, and he didn't let, he had everybody under control. It didn't matter how good of a player you were. If you messed up, you weren't playing. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Liz, and I think you kind of, like, alluded to this at the beginning of, of this, but what, like, what were you feeling when, I mean, obviously, you're, uh, part of you, I think you were like, yes, it was an answered prayer, but, but, like, inside, like, what were you kind of going through seeing, you know, because, I mean, at this point, Nate was, you know, like, he was excelling, obviously, Coach Quinn was saying this kind of stuff about you, and you were one of the, the higher prospects on, you know, for the Dinos, that, that's the UFC, and, you know, but, like, what were you thinking, I guess, at that moment when he was making these, like, really stupid decisions? Like this, this one out in... Uh... Well, this one, or, you know, like, I mean, you're, you're kind of privy to the other ones as well, but, like, what was going on inside your head when you seen, like, okay, here's my son 
who is like a gifted like football player, and he should be starting, and he should be playing, and he should be making the difference, yeah. but yet he's benched right now. Like, he's mm-hmm. sitting beside me watching mm-hmm. someone else. You know, like, what's going on inside your head? Well, I don't think I was there, but I think it was Corey and Dad that were there. Okay. But um, I, 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 thought, I thought that it was an answer to prayer, I think. And yeah. I mean, it was hard, too, because I thought, but you, you pray and you pray and you pray, and these little things come up. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's amazing what comes up. And like I, I just said, I, that's all I can really think about like with it is I believe Blake Nil was an answer to prayer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I really do. So, I mean, because you have three other boys and, and you kind of shared, you know, and I, I even know this from back in the day, you know, when we would talk about, you know, your kids making better decisions and stuff and, mm-hmm. you know, out at Eagle's Nest. And uh, I remember, I remember, I don't know which son it was, but um, I remember you specifically saying like, whether it was Corey or whatever, you know, you were like, Corey's, Corey's going to church. Okay. Do you know? Do you remember? I don't know if was you that, remember these, you? you know, these conversations, but I remember, you know, and I don't know if it was like a board thing or something, but, you know, yeah. like, I that, think you shared with me, all your sons kind of did their own thing. Did they not? Like, they kind of did yeah. their own, you know, so. Yeah, they're like, very independent and very, <clears throat> like, yeah, they kind of, they do. They're just independent and if. I don't know, what's coming to me now is when they accepted Jesus, like it's just a testimony right there that, I mean, for anybody here, that they would not accept Jesus if it wasn't real. Like I can tell right. you that. Because they're, and they don't, they're just, if it's real, they're going to do it. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, something that, but uh, yeah, something. Okay, how did, but am I getting? No, I was just wondering, like how, you know, how do you as a parent, because I mean, me as a parent, I've got, you know, a seven-year-old, a, f- a five-year-old. I've got three kids yeah. all under the age of seven. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and they just had birthdays lay off. Um, but, you know, they, they haven't been able to, like, you know, make, like, I mean, other than, like, stealing their sister's toy or, you know, saying something dumb or what. They haven't been able to make really, like, life-changing decisions. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They haven't been able to kind of, like, go astray, if I can use that word, you know, but like you as a mom had to walk through that with all yeah. four of your kids. How, how did you process that? Well, it's, it's a difficult thing and um, to go, it is really difficult to go through because you don't think that that's going to happen. Right. You just don't, you know, you raise them and then all of a sudden things, I don't know what, I don't know, like just things of the world come in and, and you, you learn to pray and, um, well, I had Tim. Like, Tim's amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, to... He is. Be, wherever he is. You know, and <laughs> I don't know where he is, but... <laughs> he got bored. Oh, no, he's back there. He's no. gone. <laughs> no, he's... I mean, he's just an amazing man, and we could, you know, mm-hmm. throw things off each other lots, and then yeah. him being, like, yeah, the, the leader. Sometimes I didn't know things that went on, you know, and, Yeah. Yeah. You, you had, when we had chatted earlier, you had said um, a real big help, and, and you kind of kind of hit the nail on the head when you're talking about, you know, like, checking into, like, the people that he was hanging out with, yeah. right? Yeah. And in your own kind of, like, like, struggles, if we can call mm-hmm. it that, you know, you had talked about how great it was to have the right people. We, we have a, a phrase here at Bridge Church. We, we did a series called Fifty Shades of They, you know, and, and I talked about just the importance of surrounding yourself oh, yeah. with the right they, yeah. right? They yeah. that like kind of push you in the direction that you yourself, you know, you want to yeah. go, right? Can so, you expand on, on yeah, maybe yeah. how important that was for you? I had, I had a few friends that I could call and I could talk to that were very good for me too, that because yeah. you need to have the body of Christ needs each other. Yeah. Like I couldn't, I could not have done it on my own. Like when your kids walk away from God, it's, it's, it's a difficult yeah. It's a difficult road, but I had friends that would, um, I could call, they would pray with me, and they were the type of friends who wouldn't, um, like, listen to, like, they would tell me the things that I needed to hear from, from God. Yeah. You know, and Tim was the same way. So, like, there might be people here who don't have a husband, but they right. can surround themselves with friends because don't try and do it on your own. Like, that's one thing I would say. Right. Is... It's huge. And God will show you people because it's a, it's a hard 
it's a hard road. Absolutely. And, and you've seen the inverse of that kind of in the picture of who Nate was surrounding himself with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the wrong they yeah. were kind of making him and yeah. helping him make, you know, dumb decisions or whatever. But um, kind of maybe mm -hmm. just switching gears here mm -hmm. for a bit. Nate, um, like we said, you got married to the beautiful Tegan in 2014. And big congrats, by the way, to them, not only in Great Cup, but that's, where, where is Grace? I think right Grace is right here. Sound that's asleep. their beautiful little uh, baby girl born. How many days after Great Cup, wasn't it? Like five. Five days after Great What a week, man. You're like trying to do the parade and you're having to be at the hospital. No, I'm just joking. Well, and our first year anniversary was two days after she was born. So. Really? Man, just lump everything together in <laughs> one week. Yeah. That's going to be tough in years to come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it hasn't always been this, this beautiful marriage. Um, you, you were married once before back in, I think you said, 2010? Uh, 12. 2012. Can you, can you just share a little bit about that whole journey of your life? Yeah, for sure. Um, so that was at the stage. So me and her had been, you know, dating kind of long distance. She was from Australia. And I was like at the peak of kind of my rebel stage in life, like 08, like, you know what I mean? So she, I think she kind of fell in love with the rebel type kind of bad guy, whatever. Um, so anyway, we were, like I said, we were going back and forth, and she went back to Australia, and, you know, whatever, we were going back and forth, but uh, I, long, like, long story, a lot of stuff happened, but I, this is when I started recommitting my life back to God, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, once I did that, you know what I mean, I was, like, new, like, born again, just new, ready to go, like, yep. like I said, I'm 110% or nothing, so I was, like, just like I am now, I'm, like, 110% surrendered, sold right. on to Jesus, so I was, uh, just pursuing Jesus, like, she could tell when we were on Skype and stuff like that, like, she could just see the light in my eye, like, just mm -hmm. all that stuff, and, you know, I, I remember she would say, I ho like, I hope you're not going to turn out like your mom, you know what I mean, like, stuff like <laughs> <laughs> Such great relationships, hey? <laughs> Is that the first time you've But I'm that? glad I did turn out like my mom. <clears throat> um, Jesus. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> so, anyway... Um, you know, she comes back. We'd already been talking about marriage for a while at this yep. stage. And, uh, you know, I made it very clear I wasn't going to marry a non-Christian. Yeah. So, you know, she heard that. And so, you know, I guess her thing was to do is become a Christian. So she told me she became a Christian. And, uh, yeah, we, get, we ended up getting married in Australia. And, um, you know, I was, you know, still I was being me. I was, you know, I knew Jesus was real. Right. And I knew that I wasn't ever going to go back to old Nate, old party Nate, all right. that stuff. So, you know, I mean, I was like living my life, sold out for Jesus. I was trying to do everything I could do to, you know, be the leader, be a godly influence in my life, in my family's life. So I was doing like, you know, trying to, you know, pray with her, do the, you know, morning devotions, read the Bible together. And, right. And I started to, I started to notice that this was kind of like a one, one way thing. I was kind of, you know, trying to pour in and I it started me doing it by myself and stuff like that. And, you know, I was like, oh, that's okay, you know, this is, you know, this is a new young Christian relationship, so things are going to, um, you know, grow, I'm going to water the seed, it's going to grow, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, like, I, uh, like I said to you on the phone earlier in the week, uh, you know, one night we were, uh, things were good, Thursday night we were watching TV, you know, don't remember what we were watching, but we were just on the couch watching TV, and then um, you know, things changed pretty quick on that Friday because Friday night she came home at, you know, whatever night, whatever time of night and started like packing a bag and told me she had to like go somewhere for the weekend. And she just told me right to my face that, you know, God's, this isn't real. Like I, like God's not real. I don't want to raise my kids like this. And, you know, I hope, yeah, it's just crazy to feel that like abandonment and like, right. it was so crazy and like, yeah, it was tough, but yeah. So anyway, um, we ended up, you know, like, obviously, the way I got brought up and the way I knew, what I knew about divorce is I knew that it is not, you know, it's not godly. God does not want you to be divorced. Right. And I was just like, oh, all this stuff, like, you know what I mean? I, Did you think you failed? Oh, yeah. I yeah. thought I failed big time because 
of like my platform at that stage. I was a professional athlete, a Christian professional athlete. Yeah. And then I was just like, everyone's just going to think I'm a big fake. Like, you mm-hmm. know what happens with, you know what happens on the news. You guys see it all the time in newspapers and stuff like that. Like professional athletes beating their wives, cheating on their wives. Right. And just like thinking. Because they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, media wouldn't have spun it like. Nate lives for Jesus, wife leaves him. Like, you yeah. wouldn't have read that as a headline, right? No, no. <laughs> you know? But, uh, so yeah, anyway, a lot of uh, healing through that process, and I had a lot of good people on my side, and, uh, you know, it actually brought me closer to Jesus because, like I said, I had that transition in my life where I knew this was real for my life. So yeah. even though a huge thing, probably the biggest thing in my life that had happened to me, like the biggest valley I had been in, it didn't matter I, I knew that there was no, like, I knew I could go to the bar and, you know, find another girl like that night, but like, right. there's nothing that, all that stuff in my life was just leaving me either close to jail or close to off football teams or, you know right. what I mean? That kind of stuff. So I knew the only thing in my life that I could rely on and all the, was the Bible and Jesus. So mm-hmm. all those promises of God in the Bible just was huge back then. And just like the power of words people spoke into my life, just yeah. helped me so much through that stage. And, uh, you know, I had good people on my side, you know, praying for me and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, came out the other side. For the better. How, Liz, I mean, obviously, I mean, hearing his comment uh, of what she had said, I hope you don't end up like, how did you, how did you forgive her? Um, well, for the for the hurt, you know, like like, yeah, like as a parent, you don't want your kids yeah. to like hurt, and you can see this. This was quite an emotional time in his life. Like, how did you how well, did you process again, that? I had people in my yeah in my life. Like Tim would um, const like he would want me to call every week. That's what one of the things he said. He said, "I want you calling her every week. You do this." Right. So that's what I did. And um, but then there was times it was the end of the week and he'd always remind me did you do this did you you have to keep loving her no matter what right. and i had friends i had a couple friends that i would call and then when certain things would happen like i i would call them up and i was broken i mean i was hurt right and i had yeah. every you know i could have gone to the unforgiveness route and just been like <sighs> but um they encouraged me you love unconditionally mm. you know what um it's easy to love someone who, who loves you? Yeah. But that's a hard thing to love unconditionally. That's like when, you know. But ultimately, in the end, it like was it really me and Nathan that she rejected? It was God in us. Yeah. That that's was right. the big thing that yeah. was she rejected. Yeah. Like right away, you know. So, but yeah, it's unconditional love when things come at you. You need to love. I, and, I just and, really feel that's just something that's really, yeah. Because you let unforgiveness come in, and it's going to eat you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's I, essentially, I, it's the opposite of unconditional love. Right. Right? But, and you have to go in the direction you don't want to go. Even if you don't feel like it, mm. you need to go in that direction. Right. Because it's not about feelings. Yeah. It's about doing the right thing, and your feelings will catch up to you. Yeah. Even if, you, you, even if everything inside of you is like, oh, I don't want to do this, and that's what I had, you do it anyways. It's true. I've learned it's the thing yeah. that works. Yeah. It's so, yeah, and even with, uh, in the area of unforgiveness, like, I, I believe I carry, I, I know I carried unforgiveness um, with, other, with other people too, and, right. it's, and it's very interesting. Like, what I, what I'm, uh, like, I was thinking about this, what came up is, after I started dealing with these people, I don't know if there's a connection or not. Like, you mean forgiving them? Is that what you mean? Yeah, like, forgiving yeah. them. Yeah. My kids started coming back to God. So I don't know if there's something, I don't know, but it's just, I just, that's what I noticed in my life. Right. Because, and it's like, you see the people, it's just like, ugh, you just can't, you can't stand them. Right. <laughs> like... <laughs> And Some of you might again, be sitting beside and, those people right now. <laughs> and, every, and then again, I, had, I surrounded myself with people who were not going to listen to that. They weren't going to, um, I mean, they, they could have gone in the direction like, oh, yeah, that's really bad what they're doing to you or whatever. But no, they did what was right for me. Yeah. They said, you need to forgive. 
you need to do this. Yeah. Or you need to go give them a hug or you need to. Right. So, yeah. And then it seems like when, once you have a root of this unforgiveness, it snowballs onto other people. Oh, yeah. Totally. So, so I, I, would, yeah. I, I think that, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, like you said, kind of when, when I st- started dealing with my crap yeah. is when my kids, you know, because yeah. I think it's totally connected, right? Uh, yeah. Where, I, where I the, the life that we live, it, yeah. it, it just, it's, in it, it's, <laughs> it's innate, innate. It's Does like, that make sense? <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's like a natural thing for a child to, you know, and I mean, you guys have all seen this, for a child to kind of mimic their parent. Right? And so if we, you know, as parents or, you know, you as a mom, you know, are walking like in unforgiveness, it's going to be a whole lot easier for your kids to be walking in unforgiveness. And so, so when true. you decide to start dealing with it yeah. and, and be a person that loves unconditionally, that's what your boys see. Yeah. That's what your kids see. So it's a natural thing for them. And I mean, I, you know, we don't have to get into the story of, you know, even your walk of forgiveness, you know, with your first wife. And I mean, he's, he's, I think, what was, what was the last thing that you said to her again? The last thing. I mean, some might be offended by this, but I think it's a great statement. Um, last, so that, so yeah, Thursday we were on the couch chilling. Friday, she left for the weekend. Sunday, she told me she wanted a divorce. That Monday was the last time I seen her. So from between from four days, thing, you know, things were really like, well, things were, you know, a normal-ish relationship. And then four days later, you know, she, uh, we were having our last conversation. And the last thing I said to her was, um, you know what I mean? I don't know what's going to happen in your life. And I just hope one day that I can see you. <laughs> Walk through the gates of heaven. It's huge. You know, I think when, when you truly forgive, that's big. Yeah. <laughs> I think a great sign, a great sign of, of forgiveness is when you truly want the best for that person. And I think that statement in itself is the perfect example of that. I mean, that's, I, that's what I, when you, when you're like, I, I want to see you in heaven. No matter. Regardless of the hurt that you caused me, regardless of the abandonment that I felt, I want to see you in relationship with Jesus. That's, that's powerful. Um, you, you guys, we got to be quick because we're running out of time. But um, real quick, tell the story of that, that devotional book. Oh, yeah. Um, so in Christmas 2010, again, this was kind of the height of my idiocy, I guess, or rebellion. Um, so at this stage, I hadn't told my parents I loved them for about 13 years, something like that. Hmm. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'm starting to like, like, I'm starting to get into trouble legally and stuff like this, and I'm starting to like, feel like that all this stuff I'm doing is just leading to death. Like, nothing, none of this stuff is like, positive in my life. Um, so, you know what I mean? I can just, like, and I could always feel my mom praying for me, no matter what, like, where I was at, I could feel my, like, my parents' prayers, like, no matter if I was, you know, completely high as a kite, or mm-hmm. at six in the morning from the last night, or whatever, anything, I could just still feel my parents' prayers. So, I was feeling like a pull, I was starting to feel a pull to Jesus, because all this stuff was just leaving me, uh, waking up at two in the afternoon, looking for a bottle of water, because I was so hungover, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just, like, wasting life away, and you know, my uh, brothers had, you know, started to come back to Jesus too. Adam at that stage was like full on back committed to Jesus mm-hmm. before he was starting to go to church. So I'm starting to feel like I'm the left, I'm the last one here. I'm like, what the right. heck, man? All my, all my closest friends are leaving me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Corey started to kind of invite me out to church and, uh, you know, um, you know, I'm turning them down a couple times, but we went home for Christmas holidays and, you know, presents and all that stuff. Woo. Um, <laughs> My mom gave me like a, just a little sports devotional, like I'm sure lots of people have got little devotionals for Christmas and, you know, you might not think too much of it and I didn't really at that stage, I was like, oh yeah, sweet, you know, a a book or whatever, Christmas present, stocking stuffer. Sorry, I'm going to pause you for one moment. What, you shared with me earlier this week where you were at when you decided to give him that book. I wasn't even going to give that to you, that that book, I was, (laughs) I had it wrapped because I was just, well, I was just getting, I was just sick of it. I was just sick and tired of you. You know, I just had had enough, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and um, I, the night before, it was Christmas Eve, and I said to Tim, I said, should I give this book to him? And I'm just like, 
And he goes, yeah, just put it under the tree. I'm like, okay, whatever. And I just throws it under. That was my attitude. I was just, I was tired of it. Mm -hmm. They just get, it just, just wears on you. And yeah. just like, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to put it's it just, under. I love my kid. <laughs> That's what right? I was. But you know what? This is, this is crazy. Carry on. Um, <clears throat> so I got that book Christmas and, you know, whatever, threw it in my pile of presents and, you know, went back to Calgary because, you know, you had to get back to the big city for New Year's Eve. So got back there for New Year's Eve and, you know, it was... We get, it was pretty crazy, you know, um, just partying hard, doing the drugs and staying up all night, that stuff. And, you know what I mean? Foot, my final season in football, CIS had just ended. And, um, you know, we're in a Christmas holiday, so I'm just, like, feeling depressed. Like, I don't have football as a high to kind of take me out of this kind of depression. So um, at this stage, I, like, I was like, uh, whatever. I was just sitting in my house, you know, waiting for the new semester to start and a couple of days off before. And I was just like, I'll just open this up. You know, I was just feeling, like, so worn out at the stage. And I just opened it up. It's like a one-page read, which was good for me because I wasn't the best reader. I'm Amen. Still not the best yeah. reader. Amen. Like, one-page reads. Yeah. That's good. Anyway, but, like, I just read it, and it just, like, boom, like, just right to my heart, like, exactly what I needed to hear. So next day, you know, flip the page again, and just, like, boom, this is just filling me up. Like, every day I'm just, like, getting so much out of this little book. Mm -hmm. And, like, I went back and read it, and it's just... It, it doesn't do the same for me anymore, but right. just like... It's for a season. Exactly. Everything that I was reading was exactly what I needed to hear at that stage, and, uh, you know, everything just, boom, hit me in the heart, boom, hit me in the right. heart, and just build me up, build me up, so it's crazy how God worked in that, because, you know... Absolutely. I mean? I, from her just, like, kind of tossing under the tree to that having a huge impact on my turn back to Jesus, and obviously with my brothers, yeah. you know pulling for me and praying for me and getting me out to church, you know, all that together yeah. helped me. Yeah. Um, you, you had shared with me earlier this week real quick, and I think maybe we'll try and kind of close with this, but um, that moment in your life kind of thing, like where you started reading that and, you know, and, and you had shared even earlier, you know, you're kind of like, you use the word identity, you know, you were like, man, I'm, I'm a gifted football player, you know. Can you, can you maybe expand on kind of what changed in your heart when you, obviously as it started with that devotional and then as you kind of got into the Bible and started relationship with Jesus, real relationship with Jesus, what, what shift happened? Well, the shift that happened was, you know, my identity. Um, <laughs> this is tough this morning. <laughs> so I no longer cared, like, I, I remember sitting with my pastor in Calgary, and I, I, like, I just surrendered my life for God, just laid it down. I said, I want to, <clears throat> like, I want to pursue this 110%, because everything I'm pursuing 110% is leaving me either almost kicked off the football team or in jail, so right. I don't care. I'm going to pursue this, because, you know, I could see the transformation in my brothers and stuff like that, so just, okay, I'm going to pursue this. I don't care what my friends think, and I didn't. Like, I said, I don't care you want to be friends with me, be friends with me. If you don't, be, don't. Like, I don't care. I'm going to pursue Jesus. Yeah. So anyway, what happened was, you know, all those people who told me what my identity was, they, they told me I was this super good athlete. They told me I was this good football player. They told me I was this, you know, life of the party. And, you know, um, that all, that was all like them, that was all fake identity. That was what they were telling me I am. And, but then from that day in January of 2010, I found out what my true identity was, and I first, for the, <clears throat> for the first time in my life, I found something that could never be taken away from me, and, uh, you know, I feel like that still happens lots of times, you know, being in, with professional, in professional sports, and just everybody, like business, everybody yeah. is pursuing something, and it gets, it's super hard, especially for men, because we, you know, we're driven by powers. Approval. Yeah, and, like yeah, approval, and that yeah. kind of stuff, and, uh, you know, especially with the economy and stuff, and, you know, people want to have the status, they want to have a nice house, they want to have nice achievements, they, you know, that we mean they think that winning a great cup defines them, but, yeah. or being a professional football player defines them, or being a super successful businessman, but as I see every year, people who have their identity in football, next day, you know, torn ACL, or concussion, you know what I mean, I see it every year, and you just see these people get broke. You guys hear about it in the news, too. People, like professional athletes, you know, killing themselves a couple years after um, they're done their thing because all of a sudden their identity is taken away from them. What they have, what their identity is in is gone from them. And, you know what I mean, um, 
I, like I said, I feel like this happens lots in today's day and age, and you know, just with the economy. Anything, there, one thing that can't be taken away from us all is our relationship with Jesus. That's right. Like, if you think about it, you could go out today. I'm kind of sick when I say this, but you could go out, your whole family could be taken from you. And then, you know, what's your identity going to be in? I could go home, I could get in a crash, and all some footballs taken away from you. You know what I mean? Like, right. People can, uh, like, nothing, none of that stuff lasts forever. The only thing that, like, it's, it's just the way it's it true. is. The only thing that can't be taken away from any of us is our relationship with Jesus. So I decided to put my 110% foundation yeah. in that. It's good. Amen. Would you guys give them another great hand? Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Awesome. One more hand. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> That's so great. You know, uh, just hearing again this kind of their perspective. You know, and, uh, and so I'm stoked for the rest of the series, and I'm just going to invite you guys just to go ahead and stand just before we close here, and, uh, you know, because I would be uh, remiss if I didn't, you know, maybe give an opportunity for maybe where you're at right now in your own life to respond to who Jesus is. You know, maybe, maybe like, like, like Liz had mentioned, you know, just walking kind of in, in unforgiveness and, and, and making that decision to forgive. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's where you're at. You know, or maybe like Nate, you know, you're kind of defining your own life by your circumstances or by your career or by even the decisions that you make. But, you know, I believe that today God wants to take you from where you think you are and who you think you are to understand whose you are. You know, and because, you know, Jesus gave his life on a cross for everyone. Liz talked about this unconditional love, and that unconditional love is shown in Christianity's most famous verse, John 3, 16, is for God so loved the world. Loved. That word loved, it actually means agape, which means unconditional love, which means like you don't have to even love him back for him to love you. You know, kind of, that's, our, that's our understanding of how love works. It's like, well, I'll love you, and I'll say I do to you if you say I do to me. But Jesus and, and God himself loved with unconditional love. And so I want to give you an opportunity to maybe respond to who God is, who Jesus is in your life. I'm just going to show this quick verse here from Luke 19.10. It says, For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. Maybe you're in here and you're like, like well, that's kind of offensive. You're calling me lost. But I'll be honest with you. Until you are found, you don't realize how lost you were. And so I would love to pray with you right now if, if maybe you've never made a decision like Nate did and like Adam and Corey and Trevor and Liz and Tim to say, Jesus, I want to be yours. So would you just bow your heads with me right now? God, I just pray right now, Father, that maybe the person that's in here that has never responded to you, that has never said, I want to take a step with you, God, regardless of their past, Father, regardless of their present, regardless of even what they think their future is, God, that you gave your son. So right now, God, I pray that you would impress upon their hearts the importance, the necessity, the need, God, to be identified as Christ's son or Christ's daughter in this house right now. God, I just pray that you just work on their hearts. And just with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to just give this opportunity to, to maybe pray a prayer. And there's no, like, you know, supernatural pr power in this prayer. It's just simply a, a, a time in your life when you can say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I accept your forgiveness so that I can maybe begin to forgive those around me. And so if that's you, I just ask you guys to join in with this prayer. The whole church, we do this every Sunday, is going to join with you and pray this prayer. And I hope and pray that right now that this is a powerful, life-changing moment in your life. Church, would you pray, Jesus, I want what you want for me today. I thank you for your gift of your son and unconditional love so that I could have life 
and life abundant with you. In your name.